thank you all for having me. Um, it's really exciting to be here. Uh, I've rubbed shoulders with SSP uh, alums and students for a long time, so it's nice to be here in the mothership. Um, and what I'm going to do today is kind of talk a little bit about an ongoing book project I have that really looks at the relationship between peacetime innovation and its impact on wartime effectiveness. And uh, the usual caveat applies here that my views expressed here don't necessarily represent those of the US government or any of its components. And so there's a debate going on, many debates actually, about the role of emerging technologies, uh, some of which are here on the screen, and how they may impact the future of warfare, right? So uh, militaries typically are assumed that if they, uh, they embrace innovation, they're more likely to reap victories, whereas those that resist innovation and are too conservative are more likely to reap defeats. And so the story goes that the character of warfare is always changing, and it is constantly threatened to render our existing capabilities obsolete. And so misfortune comes to those who allow this march of historical change to overtake them. And so this is the idea. Um, kind of comes out of very, a lot of cautionary tales, right? If you think about battleship admirals resisting naval aviation, you're thinking about cavalry generals resisting the advent of the tank and mechanization. And so there's this idea that innovation and effectiveness kind of necessarily kind of come hand in hand. And this is kind of a very intuitive idea, it's very alluring, um, but also it was wrong and has a lot of problems. And so what animates this book project is this one here. Why does innovation improve effectiveness in some cases but not others? And this very question can be slightly counterintuitive uh, because in common kind of parlance today, we think of innovation as synonymous with things like progress, with things like advancement. And at the same time, this kind of pro-innovation bias, you might say, underlies a lot of defense debates today and also underlies a lot of scholarship on military innovation. Uh, so for US policymakers, innovation has taken front and center stage in a lot of defense debates. So the US Armed Services are debating uh, the role of emerging technology, new concepts of operations to how to exploit those new technologies, how fast to undergo these changes. Um, and at the same time, these are guided by some important strategic documents like the security strategies here. And in these, there's also a focus again on the benefits of innovation. Innovation uh, underpins our military strength. It gives us an asymmetric advantage that leverages our system of technology generation, creativity, ideas. And similarly, in international relations theory, we also see a similar emphasis that innovation redistributes power in the international system. So it bestows a considerable advantage over neighbors. It provides a new way to gain advantage over opponents. And we see a similar trend exist in a lot of the military innovation studies field. So this is, you know, most people in this room I'm sure have read this piece. In 2006, Adam Grissom identified this tacit definition in the literature at the time in which innovation boiled down to changes in operational praxis that produces a significant increase in military effectiveness. And some scholars then took this definition and ran with it and made an explicit definition, really embedding effectiveness into the concept of innovation itself. And just to be clear, of course, there are scholars who have acknowledged at least that innovation is not always desirable. And some of those is on the faculty here. Um, but at the same time, regardless, theories of military innovation consistently build and test their theories on cases of innovation success. And so what I'm going to do today is challenge some of these intuitions. Uh, and I'm going to do so in two steps. And these are kind of the two main takeaways uh, from this talk. Uh, the first is that innovation doesn't always improve military power. And in fact, the book project tries to take it a step further and says innovation can actually sometimes undermine, harm, suppress military performance in wartime. Uh, and when is that more likely to happen? Well, that's kind of like the second takeaway here, which is that desperate innovation in response to an extreme commitment resource gap can undermine military effectiveness. And what I mean by this is that when a military service perceives its security commitments are expanding, at the same time its resources are shrinking, this can trigger a high-risk innovation process that puts a huge bet on a relatively new and untested and unfamiliar capability and at the same time significantly cannibalizes traditional capabilities to instantiate this new one. And what happens then is when war comes in combat, what they unfortunately sometimes find is that the new capability was overpromised and it underdelivers. At the same time, the loss of those traditional capabilities have opened up vulnerabilities that the enemy can then exploit. And so the, the logic here is that innovation has this process of creative destruction, and sometimes innovation can destroy more than it creates. And I'm, just to be clear, I'm not saying that innovation is bad. I'm, I am saying it can be done badly. 
So this is kind of the roadmap for the rest of this talk. I'm going to talk about key definitions of concepts. That is, what is military innovation? What is military effectiveness? Um, two very difficult uh, concepts to define. That's my problem, and for you to pillory me on those. Um, uh, next, I'll talk about the causal argument, kind of laying out the causal chain in more detail. I'll talk about how I test the argument. and look at some evidence. Um, the evidence is going to be drawn primarily from uh, armor innovation in the interwar period. I'll conclude with some thoughts on implications for scholarship, implications for policy. So let's start with just some key concepts here. What is military innovation? As I said, this is a conceptual minefield. But uh, for me, at least for this book project, how I'm defining innovation is it's a process of creating a new capability. And by a new capability, what I mean is a warfighting technique that tries to convert resources into military effectiveness. So services are allocated people, money, materials. They invest these things in certain types of forces. Those forces are organized, equipped, trained to carry out specific tasks. And those tasks are supposed to contribute to mission success. So you might consider, for example, an air wing designed for a strategic bombing capability. They're going to be organized, equipped, trained differently than you might say one for close air support. What this also means, though, is that innovation, at least for this project, doesn't necessarily require completely new novel technologies, as long as the underlying technology as part of this process is modified to purpose. So there's, there's this deliberate marriage between organization, technology, and doctrine. Um, what is military effectiveness? So this is kind of the outcome of interest, the dependent variable, you might say. And I define military effectiveness here as the ability to succeed at an assigned mission and acceptable cost. And this is pretty standard definition um, if you kind of truck in this literature. Let's mention a few key things here. First, it's about the ability to achieve. So it's about the ability to produce favorable outcomes. Second, that those outcomes are going to vary by mission context. So I have to specify what those are. And finally, kind of a complete definition of effectiveness, at least for, for me and for this project, is that success is going to come at a cost. And what's considered acceptable cost is going to depend on a lot of things, but primarily depend on subjective expectations about things like casualties, things like losses in equipment. And so the argument then interrogates this relationship between these two concepts, between innovation and effectiveness. And as I mentioned before, this is the research question. Why does innovation improve military effectiveness in some cases, but not others? Um, in case you forgot just four minutes ago. Uh, so uh, innovation uh, has this logic of creative destruction, as I've said. So it's this exercise in risk management. You're balancing the creation of a new capability with the destruction of traditional ones. But there's going to be this risk that you destroy more than you create. And the more intensive the creative destruction happens, the higher the risk. And so I'm arguing that um, harmful innovation is more likely to happen uh, when a service perceives that its mission burdens are expanding, its resources are shrinking, and expects the situation to continue for the foreseeable future. And I just call this condition a wicked mismatch. And so there's this huge gap between what it takes to fulfill the assigned missions that is being given to the service. At the same time, there's reduced, reduced resources. And so the service is basically being demanded to do a lot more with a lot less. And so security commitments can grow in scope, that is geographically. That could be also in terms of um, the number of priority mission objectives. Uh, they can increase in intensity. That is, it becomes harder and harder to achieve the mission objectives. That's because of things like adversaries pursuing military buildups. That could be because a diversified threat portfolio. And also, there's a temporal aspect to this, too, right? So, security commitments grow as war becomes, or seems at least, more and more imminent. Right? Because, you know, a series of diplomatic crises, et cetera. Same time, resources can decline. It's pretty simple. Fiscal austerity measures, downward pressures on the budget. Uh, there could be reduced qualified personnel in the service because of things like demobilization, retrenchment, even just the general economics of the labor market. And so certain, certain commitment resource gaps are you know, relatively narrow, and they kind of generate risk, but those risks are acceptable, they're calculable. But commitment resource gaps can grow to a size in which those risks actually become very unacceptable to the service. They can trigger desperate measures. Um, and just to be clear, um, a commitment resource gap that is an extreme in size can, of course, be driven purely just by security commitments growing or purely just by resources shrinking. Uh, but because the actual size of a commitment resource gap is arguably, and I just believe it's like almost impossible to measure that precisely, what I've done is really look at wicked mismatches as an instance of a clear extreme gap between commitments and resources. And so then this can trigger a lot of desperation in the service and for a number of interrelated crises, right? So, First, bureaucratically, the service is worried. It's losing relevance, status, autonomy. 
Uh, professionally, the service is worried that uh, it can't fulfill its duty to defend the national interest. There's also a temporal crisis. So this wicked mismatch puts a lot of pressure and exacerbates this trade-off between near-term combat readiness and investments in long-term military modernization. And so under the, a wicked mismatch, what happens is there's a lot of pressure on the innovation process. And the innovation process can then become warped. And it can be warped in three key ways, and these are kind of the three key causal mechanisms of the argument. So first is radicalism. And uh, by radicalness, I'm really referring to this level and extent of creative destruction. So how intensive is the creative destruction itself? And so you'd expect that under wicked mismatch, the, the service is going to be a lot more receptive to high-risk proposals that propose a new capability that's going to dramatically improve its effectiveness by using much fewer resources to do so. And so it's going to economize the service resources by essentially cannibalizing abilities because it's going to serve those functions as well. So it's going to become an effective, efficient substitute for the service. It offers, it offers kind of like a silver bullet solution to the service's problems. Second, there's a lot of wishful thinking. Um, and so during uh, testing, experimenting, developing of the new capability, skeptics are going to come up and say, OK, well, there's a couple of problems here. There's um, maybe the underlying technology is premature. Maybe political constraints are going to preclude its future use. Or maybe enemy countermeasures are going to significantly neutralize or even negate its ability to impact the battle space in the future. These are downplayed. Meanwhile, the critics are also worried, you know, we're losing a lot of traditional capabilities. That's going to op the, open up these vulnerabilities. So we're going to do about that. But again, the new capability is a panacea, right? It's going to plug those gaps. And so um, data that's coming out of these experiments, though by nature somewhat unreliable because of peacetime uh, experimentation, they're going to be interpreted really liberally in favor of the new capability. And finally, um, the, the development process is going to be rushed. And a part of this is an acceleration of time issue. Um, but what I'm really getting at here is that the iterative, incremental testing, experimenting, developing of these new capabilities, uh, that kind of incrementalism is circumvented. So these standard operating procedures aren't followed. And the service kind of moves forward with adopting innovation at a very rapid pace and also without the usual caution and scrutiny. Okay. So if we were to think that peacetime innovation has some sort of impact on wartime effectiveness, we might expect to see a few things, a few observable things. So in wartime, we might observe then that the service cannot achieve its mission objectives, or it does achieve those objectives, is doing so at unacceptably high cost in lives and equipment. Also, that the innovation process itself has its impact on those outcomes, because of course, these are multi-causal outcomes. So what we might see is then that the new capability overpromised, underdelivers, and it underdelivers because of the very questions and skepticism that were raised during the innovation process, but then were wished away. At the same time, the loss of traditional capabilities have indeed opened up these vulnerabilities, and that we can see that the enemy is able to exploit those vulnerabilities. And finally, a third potential observation we can see is that as the service learns under wartime pressures, what it begins to do is reverse innovation. It begins to actually try to restore traditional capabilities as a backstop, as a way to shore up its combat power. And so if I were to put this kind of argument just in a nutshell, when you kind of overstretch military organizations, you can just cause them and trigger them to innovate in ways that are potentially harmful. OK, so how do you go about testing this argument? Um, so scope conditions. Uh, I focus primarily here on peacetime innovation. Um, this is a distinction that those of you who are familiar with this literature, it's a distinction already made by the literature, where they distinguish between peacetime innovation and wartime innovation, or what they call wartime adaptation, you might say. That's because peacetime and wartime offer different learning environments uh, for the military organization, different feedback mechanisms. Second, look at major military innovations. And that basically what I mean by this is that it has service-wide effects. Is not just limited to impacting one single combat arm. And this, is, again, is another distinction the literature already makes. I depart, though, in terms of including beneficial and harmful innovations. So this is not like a narrowing of the aperture. It's really an expansion of the universe of cases. So it tries to help us, so help us um, kind of evade selecting on the dependent variable. Um, so these are the cases that I kind of selected for the book project. Um, as you'll see, the different cells kind of fill out um, how commitment resource gaps might be valued, might be measured. Um, the most interesting cell, of course, is in the right-hand corner, where here, in these cases, there's a wicked mismatch that, that then pressures the military service to innovate in ways that were harmful. 
and I do pairwise comparisons with these other cases in the other cells. These cases in the other cells do innovate as well, but they don't do so in harmful ways. So I do a controlled case comparison. And today, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus on armor innovation in the interwar period. So the evidence I'm going to present today uh, come primarily from archival documents uh, from a lot of British collections. Um, and I also pay close attention to how the historiography on armored, in a, armored warfare in interwar period have really changed in some real dramatic ways over the last 10 to 15 years. OK, so let me show you a little bit of what I found. Tale of Two Armies. I want you to kind of wind back time and think about the eve of World War II. So in the eve of World War II, there's two armies. The first army, highly radical, highly mechanized. What they do is they field all tank brigades that they expect to leverage high mobility and therefore impose strategic paralysis on the enemy. So the armies it fields are arguably the most highly mechanized in the world with the highest proportion of tanks. The second army, though, is a relatively more conservative army. They do innovate with tanks, but what they do is that they graft them more incrementally onto their World War I doctrines, World War I methods. And the army it fields is actually comprised predominantly of infantry divisions that are actually carried on horse and on foot. It may be surprising to learn that the first army is actually the British Army, um, who you know, innovated very radically, um, and at the same time, though, were known for some dramatic defeats, whereas the more relatively more conservative army is the German one. Both armies innovated to armored warfare, but the British Army embraced this radical form of armor innovation that ultimately proved self-defeating. So what happened? Well, at the end of World War I, the British Army is facing this very stark and evident wicked mismatch. So the army has continental obligations in Europe after Britain signs the Locarno Treaty to guarantee the common borders between Belgium, France, and Germany. At the same time, the British Army, the British Empire has actually expanded. It's expanded to actually its territorial peak in its entire history. It now covers a quarter of the globe, and the army is expected to police this empire. And there's also internal security problems. So the British Army has to keep track of Irish rebellion, potentially, industrial unrest, even potential revolution at home. At the same time, though, personnel and money are experiencing a precipitous decline. So after World War I, uh, the British Army is reduced in army strength by about 90% within a year, from 1918 to 1919. And what's important, what you can't really see here, though, is that the British Army never expects to ever fight again with the same level of mobilization as, as it was allowed in World War I. So they have to economize personnel. Uh, at the same time, there's an army budget crisis. So in 1919, um, the, Brid the British cabinet adopts what's called the 10-year rule. Basically, it says military budgets have to be based on the assumption there's not going to be another great war for another 10 years at least. And so the British Army's budget is pegged to pre-World War I levels. But because of inflation, actually, uh, the British Army's budget is actually less than, in real value, pre-World War I levels. And as you can see here, army rearmament doesn't really begin until 1939, which is months before World War II begins. So what does the army make of this problem? Well, every chief of the Imperial General Staff from the 1920s through the 1930s kind of view this wicked mismatch as an animating problem of British Army policy. And so this is Henry Wilson, who's a SIGS at the time, and he writes, I cannot too strongly press on the government the danger, the extreme danger of His Majesty's Army being spread all over the world, strong nowhere, weak everywhere, and with no reserve to save a dangerous situation or to avert coming danger. And so we have this army crisis. We have this wicked mismatch. And so enter the promise then of innovation. So these figures here are the key um, armor innovators of this period. And what theory expects is that uh, the army is going to be very receptive to this idea of a new capability that promises to be more effective, more efficient, and therefore a superior substitute for traditional capabilities. And that's what they offer here. And they offer something that I call armored maneuver. And the idea about armored maneuver is that a formation comprised almost entirely of tanks and set free from unarmored troops can maneuver with impunity on the future battlefield and land this decisive blow against the enemy. So Little Hart and Fuller on the left are the key theorists and publicists of this idea. And the remaining figures here are the um, key implementers in the British Army. I just want to note here that a lot of people have mentioned to me that Frederick Pyle here is clearly the most innovative of these figures because um, he innovated a new way of grooming. He, uh, he came up with this new capability called removing the mustache. And um, he cannibalized a lot of mustaches to get there. But I'll, I'll leave that up to you to decide if that's harmful innovation, beneficial innovation. I don't know. Um, I'll leave, you know, posterity will decide. Um, so I'm going to um, now kind of walk through this flawed innovation process. So Jesse Fuller's writings kind of distill a lot of the arguments being made at this time about armor maneuver. 
And him and others argued that, you know, they argued for tank primacy in small imperial wars, in internal security missions, but they really focused overwhelmingly on fighting and winning the next great war against a major European power. And so what they said was, in the future, armored fighting vehicles are going to be the only units capable of moving in the storm of steel, and also that the opening phase of any campaign is going to be this decisive clash of tanks. And whichever side gains tank supremacy, that side is assumed to have won the battle. And, not, and at the same time, though, unarmored troops were relegated to being what they called interested spectators. They would um, guard bases, they would occupy territory, but behind the conquering tanks. Not only was armored maneuver supposed to be more effective, it's going to be more efficient. It's going to economize service resources that were becoming very, very scarce. And so they proposed that a new model army, um, the new model army's eight divisions, according to Armored Maneuver, um, would be able to replace 48 present day divisions. And mechanization of this kind is going to be expensive, but it was going to be econom economical still because of the principle of substitution. So this is a little hard. No real reduction of cost nor modern efficiency is possible until a reorganization takes place. The new mechanized unit should be in place of, not in addition to, the old infantry and cavalry units. And Fuller has a similar sentiment. We have to reduce the various arms to that common denominator, the tank. Essentially, the tank and armor maneuver were going to economize the army's resources by allowing the, by the, allowing the army to cannibalize those units and replace them completely with all tank, an all tank army, really. So at the same time, though, we see the second characteristic starting to form. During testing and experimenting, a lot of problems and challenges arose. Um, I'm not, I can't get into all of them, but a key persistent challenge, though, was the problem of anti-tank defenses. And so this is Victor Germain's. I don't actually know how to say his last name, um, but if you know how, tell me. Victor Germain's, uh, he basically points out that no allowance is made for the development of the anti-tank gun or the anti-tank rifle. He basically predicts that infantry armed with anti-tank weapons could make tank charges into suicide missions. And this wasn't just you know, speculation on his part, because in World War I, we see that in combat experience. We see that the British tanks actually were indeed vulnerable to German anti-tank guns, German anti-tank artillery. And so these concerns are very reasonable, they're very plausible. But um, armor innovators, seeing the same data, interpreted it more liberally. Here's Little Heart. A few scattered guns can easily be overrun by tank force in its onward surge. The key principle is to approach from an unexpected quarter. Not only does Little Heart double down here, um, him and others argue other things. They argue that um, the infantry in these, in these tests, uh, in the future, infantry would never be given enough anti-tank weapons to, to represent the flags that were being used on Salisbury Plain. They also argued that in the future, European armies were going to be small. And therefore, if they're small, they'd always leave exposed flanks that armor can then maneuver around and avoid. So thirdly, the development process was, was relatively rushed. And so uh, the key experiments happened in 1927 and 1928. Um, and a few key things are worth noting about these experiments. First, the experimental forces, um, number one, were organized according to armored maneuver principles. That is, they were ex almost exclusively um, comprised of tanks. Second, during the capstone exercises, where you know, forces are pitted against one another in the annual exercise, um, these experimental forces never achieve their mission objectives. And finally, there's a lot of questions about data reliability because of the types of forces that could be used. So here's the army chief um, giving an address to the experimental tank force. And he says, the first difficulty, of course, you'll understand is finance. We want to make certain experiments, and we've not had the money to do what we really intended. The problem was that tanks were in short supply. The tanks that were available to the experimental forces, many of them were actually now already obsolete by their own uh, recognition. And also that the cost of building a single experimental medium tank actually exceeded the entire annual budget of tank experiments during these years. And so despite unreliable data, arguably, despite the fact that this, these experimental tank forces never achieved their mission objectives in tests and exercises, and despite the fact there were very reasonable um, countermeasures that would be fielded, the army moves forward with codifying those lessons. So the army chief tasks Charles Broad, who's a known armor enthusiast at this time, to codify the lessons of the experiments. And he does so in these two primers in 1929 and 1931, um, which basically codify the principles of armor maneuver. And then Charles Broad is then tasked 
to establish and put those into practice. He does that by establishing the first tank brigade, comprised almost entirely of tanks, that's codified. Experiments for two years, it's permanently established again. Very little change in the composition and the types of maneuvers it's expected to do. Um, as the British then construct their armored division, um, things get even more tank heavy over time. So the first, the, there's two things worth noting about this table. First, of course, is the tank brigade. It's the main fighting component of the armored division, and it remains unchanged. Basically, it is the main um, decisive arm. Uh, at the same time, though, if you look at this column here, what happens at, by, on the eve of World War II is that the cavalry are entirely um, in light tanks at this point. So there's a lot of tanks going on in this division. And at the same time, infantry and, and artillery are consistently shrunk and reduced in size. And so on the eve of World War II, what we see is that the British Army is actually, arguably, yes, the most highly mechanized in the world with the highest proportion of tanks. And this also does not account for the fact that there are infantry tanks as well that are accompanying the infantry divisions. So there's a lot of tanks in the British Army. And it's with these armored divisions that the British Army decides to fight the Desert War. And what you see here in the theater of war is that uh, you have British Commonwealth forces on one side, you have Italian and Germans on the other, and you can see it's kind of seesaws back and forth across the Libyan desert for about three years. What we see, though, is that the British Army consistently fails to achieve mission objectives at acceptable cost until about late 1942. So in the first phase, what we see is uh, the British Army performs very poorly. In the one case in which it does actually achieve its mission objectives in Operation Crusader, uh, it does so at unacceptably high cost in lives and equipment, and the German counterparts aren't that displeased with the result, actually. But in the second phase, you start seeing certain things start to change. You start seeing the British Eighth Army being able to achieve mission objectives at acceptable cost. And what's happening? Well, I'm basically going to make the argument that in the first phase, what's happening is that armor maneuver is failing to provide what it promises, and the lost judicial capabilities have left it exposed. And as it's learning in wartime environments, what's happening is it's slowly restoring traditional capabilities that they learned on the Western Front, but they had lost in the interwar period. Uh, typically, I would just move on and just, you know, paint broad brushstrokes. But since I'm at SSP, I know all of you love the tactics and love the operations. Um, I'm going to just talk about two operations, kind of just briefly. I'll talk about Operation Battle Axe as representative of that first phase, and I'll talk about Second Alamein as a representative of the second phase. So historians treat Battle Axe as really like the first real test of British armored warfare. Um, not only are British tanks here in healthy numbers, it's also their first clash with German panzer troops, veteran German panzer troops. And they had three key objectives. So first, the British Armored Division is going to attack Hafid Ridge, where it expects to find the German panzers. It's going to destroy those panzers, and this is the decisive phase of the operation. After the panzers are destroyed, they're going to make quick work of the remaining unarmored troops. Same time, um, infantry brigades are going to capture Halfaya Pass, point two oh six at Fort Capuzzo, and then uh, the remaining Axis force are going to be trapped between these divisions, destroyed. The rest of the British force is going to move north, and they're going to relieve Tobruk, which is this critical supply port, but held by the British, but actually under siege at the time. What happens? Well, what we see is that actually none of the mission objectives are achieved. So on the first day, the British lose about half their tanks. On the second day, they try to maintain their position and struggle to do so. And on the third day, they just withdraw because German encirclement is coming. And what, what explains this? Well, um, our maneuver really shaped these results. So recall that tank mobility is supposed to counter anti-tank weapons, and also that the decisive phase of this campaign is this clash of tanks. They're going to seek uh, to destroy the enemy tanks as the first maneuver. Both aspects uh, contributed to British failure. So British failure and German success really hinge on what happened at these two places, at Hafid Ridge and Halfaya Pass. And these locations, for a grand total of nine anti-tank guns, the Axis forces repelled multiple attacks by the British Armored Division in the west, and also the 100 or so heavy tanks supporting the infantry brigades in the east. What do you need? Well, to close with such fixed defenses, what you need is infantry spotting. What you need is indirect artillery fire. Uh, but these things were gone. Now, um, the, a third observable implication, as I mentioned, was that the British Army is going to try to restore traditional capabilities in hopes of shoring up its combat power. And we do start seeing this happen after battle acts. There's some fits and starts. There's some dead ends. Um, but what we do see is that by fighting around El Alamein in 1942, the, the British Army really has started to restore a lot of the British expeditionary force expertise that it had lost. 
So first, what we start seeing is a rebalancing in armor divisions. We start seeing the increase of tank infantry components relative to the tank components. We see the British armor divisions begin to be trained not as um, you know, primary armored maneuver units, but starting to be trained more as all-purpose organizations, much like the German Panzer divisions were, the integrated artillery, infantry, and armor. And finally, if you recall, the opening gambit of a lot of the operations that came before this was you're going to sally forth the tanks. You're going to go find the German Panzers. You're going to destroy them. Once you do, things will be a lot better. Bernard Montgomery, who's commanding this um, operation, he reverses the playbook. He's going to say, we're actually going to start with artillery infantry attacks on unarmored positions. We're going to hold our tanks in reserve. And simul simultaneously, before this, uh, Bernard Montgomery is actually retraining the army. And he's retraining the army to restore traditional capabilities. And so Second Alamein really is a set piece battle that's fit for the Western Front. So it begins with this massive and sustained artillery barrage against enemy artillery. That's a counter battery program. Then it's followed by creeping barrages that are timed, to, timed with advancing interest, infantry, their pace. Infantry, they, re, they revive by and hold tactics, never traveling beyond the cover of artillery fire. And the armor is tethered more closely to the infantry. And what we see from this then is actually they're able to achieve mission objectives and they do so at acceptable cost in lives and equipment. Okay, I've told you a beautiful story. Some of you may not believe it, um, but here are some alternative explanations, right? Like what, what, could, what, what, what else could explain harmful innovation in the British Army? Well, as I mentioned, a lot of theories of military innovation, um, they, don't, they don't really try to systematically explain harm caused by innovation. Um, the theories that do try to look at the British armor case tend to treat the British case and the case of British armor as a case of non-innovativeness, of being too conservative, being too wedded to older ways of war. And the Germans are typically treated as the more revolutionary radical ones. I've kind of told you a completely opposite story here. But we can derive some alternative explanations from these existing, these existing uh, theories. And some of them are listed here, these kind of potential factors that might have shaped the innovation process in a harmful way. So first, what about the lack of resources? So organizations need resource slack to play and test with new ideas. And uh, this has some affinity with my argument, of course. But my argument's more interested in actually the size of the gap. What's the relative gap between those resources and the security commitments, not just the scarcity of resources itself? And so to be sure, the British Army, as I've mentioned, did suffer from financial problems, but so did the German Army. So did um, the Bundeswehr. So uh, what do we see then is that the Germans offer interesting counterfactual where the Treaty of Versailles limited their resources, didn't allow them to have tanks. We could talk about the, the Kazan experiments at another time. Um, but that kind of created a similar environment. But yet they both innovated with tanks and their effectiveness diverged. What about technological characteristics? Well, you know, analysts like talking about disruptive technologies. Disruptive technologies improve warfighting performance, but they do so along a devalued warfighting trajectory. And so, therefore, these types of technologies are easily misapplied. But again, uh, we see the Germans as a counterfactual. What about strategic culture? Well, strategic culture theorists talk about um, countries having relatively, relatively stable beliefs, attitudes, values about the threat and use of force. And so if innovation was harmed by strategic culture, we would expect then that innovation would be channeled radically toward a nationally preferred mode of warfare, as opposed to the most effective one. And um, if there was a British way of war, that's debatable, but if such a British way of war existed at the time, Britain would have preferred to play the role of offshore balancer in European affairs. It was a maritime state. It would have invested those resources into naval power. But the focus here, though, has been on radical innovation in the army, contrarily. And finally, organizational culture. Organizational culture could put on cognitive blinders. You might channel innovation towards capabilities that align with a service's self-identity as opposed to mission success. Um, well, innovation theories that focus on British army culture as a variable, an explanatory variable, really focus on British army officers misapplying tanks because they're too focused on the imperial defense mission. Um, but as I've shown you here, actually, the armor maneuver was designed as a panacea. It was going to cover all the bases and also focused overwhelmingly on a continental missions. Okay, going to conclude. We're almost there. Conclude with some um, policy implications and scholarly implications. I'll start with some scholarly ones. Um, so first, it's pretty intuitive here, hopefully, that the first 
the implication is really for military innovation studies. So innovation studies um, overwhelmingly focus really on explaining the presence or absence of innovation, um, which is important because organization, military organizations are conservative, they're bureaucratic, uh, they're highly risk averse, and so therefore getting, getting it to innovate is important. But if innovation doesn't have always beneficial results, if it actually varies in its results, then you might, to some extent, have the problem of selecting on a dependent variable here. And so the, the, the book project, at least, hopes to push the field to really start focusing on the quality of the innovation process itself. Um, second, we as humans like to focus on change. Um, and we oftentimes ascribe kind of a disproportionate importance to those changes. But historians of science and technology have really started pioneering how we think about maintenance. What happens after innovation? Why? is maintaining infrastructure really important, both metaphorical and physical, for long-term success of organizations. And so this research really buttresses a lot of these intuitions where traditional capabilities tend to have a lot longer shelf life to persist in their relevance and their contributions to mission success much longer than many radical innovators might have us believe. Um, third, um, this work highlights um, harmful innovation as a negative repercussion of incoherent grant strategy, of this misalignment between foreign economic and military policy. And it also suggests potentially that innovation can create an illusion, an illusion that a grant strategy is effective and it's sustainable. And so it might create, um, uh, it might obscure, you might say, misalignments, or it might make mis these misalignments seem like they're easily realigned by a silver bullet panacea solution. And finally, um, historians of military innovation um, do have this tendency to treat innovators as kind of heroes and the conservatives, or you might call them maintainers, as kind of the villains. But once we inject a lot of risk calculation, a lot of nuance into these stories, um, what we see is kind of emerging is really not like a Marvel movie um, of like, you know, good guys and bad guys, but really something that's actually hard to tell who, who's right, who's wrong. And a lot of that might actually have to do with the fact that the character of war changes potentially much slower than military futurists acknowledge. Policy implications. We have to talk about China, of course. And so um, and I'm scared because I see a lot of China experts here. Uh, so uh, what does this have to say about um, the military competition between the United States and the People's Republic of China? Well, um, if we consider the PLA and the other services um, what are they thinking in terms of commitment resource gaps? Well, we might say, we might argue, that their commitments are relatively lower than the United States, right? They're focused primarily on the near seas. At the same time, Beijing is allocating significant manpower, significant resources to the military services. And if that's true, I mean, we can debate if that's true or not. Um, I trust the military experts of Ch PLA experts here in the room. But if that is true, then that would suggest that the PRC's capacity for military innovation is relatively healthy, is relatively robust. But things in the United States seem a little bit more dire, a little bit more pessimistic today. So um, the US Armed Services um, likely are trying to just figure out, are we in a wicked mismatch or not? Um, and that's going to be driven by lots of things. It could be driven by our threat assessment of China, Russia, Iran, to some extent North Korea. It's going to be driven by um, beliefs about trend lines, beliefs about the defense budget, beliefs about recruitment levels, um, which seems stagnant at the time right now. And regardless, though, what we do hear coming out of the military services is a lot of dramatic language about innovation, a lot of uh, lip service being paid to how the military needs to embrace radical forms and re completely rewire the way we fight wars. And the book project essentially will urge caution. Basically, it says, Instead of radical innovation, consider, for example, what incremental innovation might actually look like. What would it look like in our testing and experimentation to really focus on potential political constraints on these new capabilities, um, potential enemy countermeasures? And also, what is the actual maturity of the underlying technologies that we're dealing with here? And are they even ready for scaling? And also, finally, um, it would suggest that we should really prolong the experimentation process as long as possible. Um, before we rush into um, production and scale. Um, that is all I have for you. Um, you can find my information here on the screen if you don't have time to ask your question or email me your comments. Who knows how long I'm going to be on Twitter, formerly, oh, formerly known as Twitter. And, um, but I look forward to your comments, your thoughts, um, and your questions. Thank you.
Dr. Quo, so I'll just start here and take a few. So let's go Eric Lynn Greenberg first. Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Uh, Kendra, thanks so much for this talk. So, so I think I largely buy what you described as I think your, your beautiful story. Um, but I was wondering if you could maybe talk just a little bit more about this, this rush development mechanism, right? You're, you're giving us this story about peacetime innovation. Um, there seems to be enough time that there could be something other than rush development. So why do we see rush development, right? In the case that you walked through today, some of that development starts in the 1920s when you know, the, the eve of World War II is, is still far, far away. So why do we see this kind of rush development process as opposed to having folks say, hey, go back to the drawing board and experiment a little bit more? Or we can play both or just want no, to go we'll do, forward. We'll do the same. Oh, great. Okay. That's easier. Okay. Um, in the, so rush development, in the British case at least, um, in the 1920s, we actually already start seeing a lot of imperial unrest. So it's not just the fact that they're worried about this future continental war. They're worried about, in the 1920s, the internal security problems. And they're also worried about the fact that they have lots of ungovernable colonies, you might say. And there's actually, at this time, a spread of small arms um, in, the, in uh, colonial dominions. And so that, there is this pressure to do something now. Um, at the same time, resources are declining already, which means that you need to do something. Um, the, the rush development mechanism, though, is also maybe more clearly shown in the U.S. Air Force case, which is not, for, not given here, but after World War II, um, the U.S. Air Force is um, innovating this air atomic blitz capability, really cannibalizing tactical air command mm -hmm. and continental air command to do so. And what they do is they really start investing in this strategically, make that strategic decisions before a lot of key commissions are done, even with their uh, research about whether or not it would actually be possible to penetrate Soviet air, de air defenses and also if it would even work. Um, and they also start going to scale with the, um, their aircraft, their bo the strategic bombing aircraft, uh, before all the testing is done. So there is like this more of um, a clear mechanism there for the U.S. Air Force case. But at the same time, the pressures do exist for the British Army. Very close. I think Phil was ahead. Phil, Phil go ahead. Yeah. I, so I gotta. I've been I've been doing some work on affecting this for a while, and I have a question about your DV. It appears to me that you're measuring with your DV both effectiveness and efficiency. And I'm wondering why you're adding efficiency as an acceptable cost. I'll give you an example. Um, the Japanese uh, and their kamikaze, one of the most effective um, you know, innovations, and yet some would argue the costs are not acceptable unless you begin some endogeneity in terms of what culture will allow as acceptable costs and what the missions are. So what does adding the efficiency to your DV add to your argument? Why do you need that acceptable cost associated with this? I think at least my logic, at least, um, was that innovation is essentially an efficiency function. So it's promising to provide those efficiencies. And also when you read kind of what they're saying, oftentimes what they're doing is they're making the case for this new capability not only that's going to achieve this mission objective, but do so with f much fewer cost. And so I kind of, kind of tried to tie the line between the innovation concept and the effectiveness concept, and efficiency was in both of kind of those equations, you might say. Does that answer your question? Well, please, please continue pushing. I, I, I just see problems with it for why you have to have that. It looks to me that the effectiveness gives you the answers that you need without bringing up these problems of what's efficient, who decides what's efficient, is it ex ante, ex post? I, I just see there being some pushback on that DV. Okay. Yeah. Polina, Polina Bellico. Yeah, thank you. So, Henry, this is a fascinating topic and a very intriguing question. I want to ask several clarifying questions to make sure that- You only get one. No, I'm just joking, you could have a lot. <laughs> Yeah, but if it takes several clarifying questions, yeah. you, you may want to hear them. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. You can give several answers to this. So, uh, you're explaining flawed innovation. How do we know and when do we know that it's flawed? Because it seems that we derive it from the outcome, and then it conflates an element of your causal chain with the dependent variable. And, and also, your theory seems to explain the flawed process of innovation. So it's like difference between process rationality and outcome rationality is the same. Is the flawed 
innovation flowed by the process or by the outcome. And related to this, the elements of the flawed process that you outlined are radicalism, wishful thinking, and rush development. My first question, are they mutually sufficient, necessary? What is the relationship between them? And also whether they can produce an innovation that will not prove to be flawed on the battlefield. Can it be that a process that was rushed radical and based on wishful thinking just because of the battlefield conditions if we me if we measure the flow flowness of innovation by the battlefield performance will still perform well even though the process was not optimal uh, and to, to that uh, topic can these conditions radicals wishful thinking and rush development arise not when there is a mismatch between the commitment and the resources because that's the beginning of the causal chain right the mismatch but I can imagine that these three can arise independently of the mismatch for other reasons. So maybe it was one question. Well, I, there's a lot of, uh, I, I will uh, um, cherry pick among the easier ones. No, um, um, how do we know when or how do we know it's flawed? And I kind of, kind of put like a stake on using kind of an outcomes kind of approach to seeing that. I think anyone that really tries to wrestle with the relationship between innovation and effectiveness is essentially caught in kind of a dilemma. You're caught in this dilemma because if you want to talk about whether or not innovation is good or bad ex ante, people are going to say, well, you only know if it's going to be working or not in, in hindsight because that's the whole point of innovation. You don't know. It's like unfamiliar. It's something new. But then if you go into look at the outcomes, you're going to say, OK, well, how do you know if it's really the impact of the innovation, if it's good or bad? Or do other factors simply swamp the effect of the innovation itself in, in producing that outcome? Um, and both are just, it's kind of like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't in some senses. And so what I basically tried to do is, what I should really show here is like, although I'm staking a claim on this outcome um, kind of approach to effectiveness, what I try to do is identify lots of factors that should that that could play a role in those outcomes, and to try to try to tease out once you account for those factors, what remaining causal impact can be had, and try to trace that impact of the innovation process in peacetime, how it impacted things in wartime. So you might say, for example, in these cases, um, in the desert war, the British army, for example, is uh, consistently preponderant in numbers and both tanks and in terms of personnel. Um, the quality of tanks, um, you can argue about how do you define, how do you measure the quality, but relatively at parity with German panzers at the time. Um, you might think about things like morale. You might think of things like command. All these type of other factors that might play into it. And if you try to really see in regime type, for example, and therefore you can try to tease out um, what remaining um, causal variation is left uh, for innovation. Um, in terms of whether or not the elements in the process are mutually sufficient and necessary, the relationship between them, in the cases I've seen, all three are present. Um, so there's no real theoretical reason why they can't be separated. Uh, although I would note that in your final question, though, about whether can the three ca key causal mechanisms arise because there's a mismatch between commitments and resources, I think yes in some cases and no in others. So you might think of, for example, it would be surprising to um, see a highly, cons well, the standard wisdom being that military organizations are highly routinized, prefer stability, um, that they are conservative. You might expect then to see radicalism to be re relatively rare, that you wouldn't really see um, an organization like a whole military service willing to undertake such radical reforms unless something's really happening here, some really external pressures are going on. Whereas wishful thinking, you see it everywhere sometimes to some extent, um, in both directions, you might even say, right? that traditional capabilities are still relevant, um, despite maybe countervailing facts. OK. OK. Uh, before we take a couple more questions, I just want to add another case in to help generate sort of thoughts about your theory. Uh, I think a lot of us here, we're interested in Russia-Ukraine war right now, and how your theory helps apply to that. 2014 to 2020, is that one thing, your scope conditions, where the Ukrainians and the U.S. are, are calling a lot of shots here, is that peacetime or wartime? And your box, shrinking, growing commitments, 
Um, and it's, it seems to me that the U.S. sort of forced desperate innovation onto the Ukrainians here. Uh, as far as, you, but your terms, desperate innovation, um, the, the, the peacetime scope conditions, uh, the, the level of, of, of commitments, because your theory uh, makes some sense there, because it seems that the, this has been a, a big innovation of a major European force now, the Ukrainians, and it, it didn't seem to amount to much. Is this a, a case in your favor when you think about it? Is it an unclear case? Is it not fit your scope conditions? But can we add this into your, your sort of analysis? Oh, um, so when I think about the Russia-Ukraine war, I guess what I, I guess when I look at the conflict, I don't really see it through the lens of the actual causal theory itself. I really think of it in terms of what is actually making impact on the battlefield. Is it the most innovative new capabilities of autonomous systems and all these type of things, these gadgets, or is it actually artillery? Is it a return to more traditional ways of warfare that had to be recovered? In many ways, the Russians even deviated from their conventional way of war and they, they tried something new and didn't actually work and they had to now relearn how to do combined arms attacks yet again. And so it seems like if it's the causal story, it actually fall more into the latter end of it, of the restoration aspect of it, of restoring traditional capabilities. Um, but from the Ukrainian U.S. side, it seems that your mechanisms, there, there was a pretty radical transformation of Ukrainian fighting. There seems to be a lot of wishful thinking about it. And it seems like there's, is there a rush development or not? Yeah, I actually don't know. I mean, most of the analysis I see is that the, 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 the blame or culprit being that the United States was forcing the Ukrainians to fight in the Western way of fighting as opposed to something more attuned with the way that their doctrine and their organization is more used to doing. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Yeah, Barry. So I don't know whether this adds a variable to your theory or it just adds a wrinkle to your case. So, for historical reasons at any given time in armies, you have well-developed branches of service around particular arms. So infantry, cavalry, artillery. Okay. And these are communities. By the way, this is not original to me. I would say I'm channeling maybe Owen and the Harvey. Um, some innovations, which are operational, tactical, depend for their success, we find out after the fact, on very high levels of interbranch cooperation. Some may not. Right? The one you pick here happens to depend on very high levels of branch cooperation. And not just the willingness, but elaborate exercise and training and doctrine to work out the procedures for doing it. You know, we're seeing it in Gaza right now with the Israelis. Very elaborate Iran and worked out procedures for cooperation. So in your you know in your in the case that you present I just don't think it can be sustained that the tankers took over the British Army. I, you know, I, empirically, this is not the case. Right? And in 1940, if you look at the expeditionary force, what is there, one armored division on the continent and infantry divisions? The fact is that all the money and all the machinery goes to essentially motorize and mechanize everybody all at once. Right? So it's just not a correct characterization. It may be a correct characterization of what happened in North Africa, which is an interesting historical question right? and says something about the British Army. So what you're pointing to is that within the thing that's created, the armored division, right, branch cooperation is really kind of lousy. And this is true across Europe at that time. The only country that masters this is the Germans. Everybody does it incrementally, and even though the U.S. comes into the war late, we have the same problem. Right? So I'm returning to whether the question, you know, it's an interesting historical question we're talking about here, 
but whether there's a, 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 a theoretical question that, you, that is in, that's buried in your analysis, and that's the question of what's the existing cultural makeup of the different branches of service in any given organization, right? And how much does the thing that's being proposed ultimately depend on its success for cooperation across these branches, which is a hard thing to organize ex ante. It almost seems like it has to be developed organically. First you make the bet, then you learn. So I said a lot there, but any reactions you might have to that, I'm sure those are uh, I think there's a, um, I think it is true, yes, that the tankers didn't overtake the entire British army, but I would say that the British army, as you mentioned, had a overwhelming kind of enamorment with mechanization, that it was a, a solution to their uh, concerns about relitigating World War I and its ability to fight with so much bloodshed yet again. Um, and so it seemed like, at least in my reading of like the army journals and stuff, that it was not that they were allergic to mechanization at all, right? It was mainly what's the pace, how fast should we actually end up mechanizing? How fast should we actually start taking on these new technologies? Um, on the question of, of interbranch cultural makeup, um, I think the historiography, at least on the British Army, in terms of whether or not the inability to coordinate between the different combat arms was a cultural issue um, is live and up for debate. How, how professionalized were, was the British Armor, uh, Army Corps at the time, and also how much of that professionalization break down those barriers between those uh, cultural firewalls between the different um, units? I think it is, it is a good point that I'll take it on. I, I don't really have a strong response to what happens when what it requires for success is that it's an interbranch cooperation. It, it, I guess I would just fall back onto a higher level of organization at the service level of whether or not jointness across services, not just within the service, is um, well, is both required. Both problems matter. Both problems matter. Depending yes. On, depending on the level of innovation. Yes. They're, they're both extremely serious innovation problems. Yes. They have to be represented in your theory somewhere. Yes. Um, the, in the, what's, I'm going to turn again to the U.S. Air Force case, but of course the U.S. Air Force's proposal is that we don't really need the Navy or the Army. Um, they were just going to do the mop-up operations in Europe after the war's over. And it, they <laughs> will never know. Um, but I'll take it on more. Thanks, Barry. Eric Higginbotham. Yeah, so I, I was going to ask the same question. I'll, I'll ask the same question in a different way. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I've done some work on this. I actually did some of the same cases. I came to, well, I rejected the same theories. And I supported at least one of two ways that you framed the answer. So, you know, in, at the end, you said quality of innovation process, right? And then I take from the rest of the presentation that you're thinking of that at, and largely as a product of these other things, right? The, the quality of the innovation process derives from the, res the match between resources and tasks. Yeah, one way, yes. But I guess that's my question is, to what extent is that true? So in looking at these cases, um, you know, so are there other things about the nature of the organization that determine the quality of you know, the innovation process? So the U.S. military did the same thing between the wars, or, or much worse, right? We returned the cavalry with the saber, all the rest of that. And yet, um, you know, when the war broke out, the U.S. was able to sort of replicate a lot of what the Germans did. The British really, really failed over a much longer period of time. So we entered much later than they did, and you sort of have success by Alamein. That success was effectively a return to World War I methods, not a replication of German World War II methods. I mean, you have creeping barrage and things like that. That's Montgomery, return to World War I, totally different. And then they make similar mistakes, you know, all the way through the European campaigns, good, you know, uh, Goodwood, et cetera. Whereas the U.S. has a system in place, you know, despite this big mismatch between the wars and despite it having driven it in really weird directions between the wars, we do have a system in place where coordination takes place, doctrine is developed very systematically, there's incremental improvement, there's a whole process in place. So that's, that's my question. Aren't a lot of those things really important to outcomes? And I'm sorry, just one last detail. So in the British case, there are sort of 
really patent examples. So Barry talked about the difficulty of coordinating, uh, you know, the the different arms within a division. The divisions really were just collections of battalions. So if you look at what they did in, in the desert, when they pulled the division back to rest, each battalion went to a regimental cantonment to train and re refit and re-equip. They didn't train together, and that's completely unlike what the US military did. They took their divisions out, sent them back to training locations, tested new doctrine, etc. So anyways, that's Long, I apologize, but, but same sort of question about the quality of innovation and, and processes. You've run into a buzzsaw of people with World War II obsessive complaints. <laughs> no, no, that's what I was scared to present here. I was like, oh my God, everyone's going to know this case. Um, uh, how would you kind of conceptualize what is that, what is that stuff in the organization? You mentioned court, like internal mechanisms for coordinating arms. Is that how you would conceptualize that, or what would you? So I think it re so I think it requires strong top-down organization. It requires a doctrine. So in a lot of ways, this confirms parts of your story, right? About innovation itself not being the answer, right? It really has to do with systems and systems of systems. Um, but you really need those mechanisms that create continuous improvement. And part of continuous improvement is is capturing the current state of the best, right? So that is doctrine and then incrementally improving doctrine based on feedback from either exercises or combat. So, you know, I borrowed from the, when I did my work, I borrowed from the Japanese literature on continuous innovation. Um, what's, I guess in the British Army case, what's interesting is that uh, during the interwar period, their um, field service regulations, the FSR, which are their capstone doctrine for the British Army, um, actually did pay lip service to combine arms. and did pay lip service to the fact that you needed all these arms, um, but that isn't what they trained for. That's not really what they did. And also what's interesting is after World War I, what they do is they start devolving command, right? They start decentralizing, thinking that they need to decentralize as opposed to force a top down in order to have smaller units to then be more survival on the battlefield. Um, I'm not sure how that intersects with that variable um, in terms of there is some elements of top downness. Um, but at the same time, there's a deliberate effort to devolve um, as a way to solve some of the World War I challenges that they saw. And of course, the, the, the troops, unfortunately, were just were not trained enough in order to do that kind of mission command style type of fighting. Um, there was a radical decentralization. Yeah. If I can see, we have Eric just talking here. You, Eric was just mentioning there has to be continuous improvement from feedback in this process of exercises and combat. One of the things we're doing here at SSP is war gaming a lot. And can you get feedback from these war games? It seems like war games should be your mechanism of wishful thinking, tell you if you're really wishfully thinking. And how does war gaming and what we're doing here in these in the rooms here have to do with, with actual learning and uh, innovation, if at all? I guess it depends if the war game, if the red teaming is serious or not. It depends if whether or not the war game is actually um, sincerely trying to distill certain enemy countermeasures that they might be taking, how much leeway and creativity the red team is using, or how much is the war game really just being there as a rubber stamp to um, endorse uh, General's favored concept of operations, um, so it would have to. We'd have to delve into yeah, the quality of the war gaming itself in many ways. And do some groups do it better than others? Oh, I, I'm I'm like being recorded right now. I I, uh, I can't make. Uh, no one's paying me to say anything. Um, no. Uh, I yeah. I I mean yes. I I'm like. Uh, <laughs> There's always a story I don't know about if I like say. Germans and your oh, I see, doing I see. some like board game and figure, hey, Blitzkrieg will work, you know, and and um, then they, they innovate. But that's not the way it works in your story. Yes, well, I sorry, I thought you thought you were talking about like today, and well, you wanted me to like about today too. Oh, okay, well, these uh, guys. I'm just curious uh, whether these guys, Eric and Eric, who run our war gaming, are they is this innovation part of the game? I think part of the issue, issue for at least in some of the rushed innovation rushed development processes is that you might have one war game or two, but it's not iterative, right? You just move forward. You kind of see, you kind of get what you need out of the war game and you move forward with the innovation process itself instead of having it iteratively done in multiple different types of settings, different stakeholders, et cetera. So it's about the distribution and variation of the war games themselves. 
All right, talking about Wargamers, Ben. Um, as someone who cares about uh, the case a lot and wargaming, I won't ask any questions on those subjects. Uh, and instead, I'm really curious about an element of your theory and how you define military effectiveness. So like in the case, as, as Phil was talking about, you define military effectiveness as achieving military operations at an acceptable cost. Um, but in a dyad between competing states who are both innovating, it seems like it's impossible for both to achieve their military objectives if they're in conflict with each other, which seems to lead to like a deterministic outcome that two states that compete with each other cannot both be effective at military innovation. And this seems, in my mind, a little overly deterministic, like you can make all the right innovation decisions and still lose. And so I'm curious about how you can operationalize a definition of military effectiveness that doesn't then fall back on the competition between two states and can be um, uh, measured independently. God, I feel like I'm back in grad school. Um, so many methodological questions. Uh, um, I guess I'll have to think about that a little bit more. I don't necessarily, at least my gut says that's not necessarily true that in a, at a two-sided like a conflict at a battle that only one side can achieve mission objectives. They're, they're, they're determined for themselves mission objectives. I don't know if that's necessarily true depending on how you define those objectives and how, how down attack level you get. So I'm not entirely, I, I'm, I'm scared that Barry is smiling and, and smirking in a scary way, but I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I buy it, but we could talk more. I don't really know if I buy it. Okay. Charlie, you have a two finger on this? Go ahead. Yeah, this and also related to the earlier question about how you use, you know, the counterfactual. Um, but it does seem like, in a way, effectiveness should be like given your, you know, given your resources, have you done as well as you can against the threat, which might not be success, but you could have done worse if you didn't innovate properly. Um, and so, looking at that, you know, looking at it in terms of success, I think is really it strikes me as problematic. I think it's it's way better to look at the the causal, the links in potential that could lead to failure, than to look at the outcomes because it's. It's related to both sides can't win, but it's also related to, you know, you might have done as well as you could um, and lost badly or something like that, and you might have innovated effectively. But then that, that raises a similar issue about your mechanism, which is if you're in the sort of wicked mismatch, maybe what you need to do is rush and, um, and sort of cannibalize your existing force. Because maybe that's the only way, maybe that's what you have to do to have your best chance of doing reasonably well. Because you're trained in a sort of very difficult situation. So doing these things that you wouldn't do under less tense situations or less pressing situations isn't necessarily wrong. It might be right. And you, did, and you might still do poorly. And then, if so it's just, um, I mean, I know it's not really resolvable, but it seems like you've skirted over it in both directions, at the outcome side and the mechanism side, what you want to count as for. I think on the, the latter part of what you said, Charlie, um, in terms of, it essentially kind of boils down to like, what else is one to do, right? Like, you already put me in a difficult bind, and what other choice do I have but to innovate in this, maybe suboptimal way, but it's hyper-rational to do so, to make this bet because I have no other choice. Um, I think of that kind of, is it rational or not? Is it irrational to do this or is it actually rational to do this? Um, in a couple of ways. I think first off, um, you could do things that the behavior itself is rational, but your justification, self-justification for it is pathological. Um, at the same time, you could imagine a military organization saying, I'm in this bind, this wicked mismatch. Um, there's these pressures to do so, but we still have agency to some extent. And we could say, I'm actually going to still choose to innovate incrementally with the, a different bet. My bet is that the traditional capabilities actually might still be relevant and actually be sustainable. And I'm going to make that a, a bet in a different direction, which also requires a gamble. Um, and also, it, it ultimately, the wicked mismatch it's kind of a civil military relations problem. It's like it kind of, in many ways, the military service can like try to appeal, and they do in these cases, appeal to policymakers and say, we're in a difficult situation. Um, this, is, this is an incoherent strategy, and we need to do something about it. And oftentimes, the wicked mismatch persists, and the service expects it to persist because the policymakers are intransigent. 
they're not going to move. Um, but we could imagine if we push the problem higher um, to the civil-military relationship and whether or not integration is happening at the political and military levels um, can produce healthier strategic planning, then that could have downstream effects. So you can have it go upwards in a way. Although this model kind of takes that as exogenous uh, for the case. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, you were talking about pure tank operations. And there are some other examples. For example, in the latter part of World War II, the Soviet forces had tank divisions which really were principally tanks. They didn't have self-propelled artillery, and they didn't have APCs. So when the infantry could not keep up, and the artillery could not keep up, the tanks would, overrun, would outrun them. And Manstein, in 1943, had lots of funds beating up on pure tank forces. Uh, and it, it did not work out well for the Soviets. So that, that's just a minor point there. And just a request, could you put the slide with the three reports back up for just a second? Three reports. The innovation Your reports. Your implications. The accelerated change. Your marine 2030. Oh, oh, this one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was like, what is Thank you. Oh, 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 that's what you, oh, I thought you wanted to, have, you wanted to talk about this. Yeah. I think we're having up on the screen this entire time. Yep. I want to bring in the military fellows we have here and get their opinion, but just to review your, your theory here, in your two-by-two two box of commitments and resources, the United States right now is in which box? Growing or shrinking commitments and growing or shrinking resources? I think it's debatable. I'm not really actually sure because it depends on whether or not um, the U.S. military, well, which service, and also if that service is important for the China fight, how important for the China fight. Um, uh, so for argument's sake, just to your theory, if United States commitments are growing but its resources are also growing, your prediction would be that desperate in innovation is less likely. You're going to get... It's relatively less. The incentives are not as strong there. Okay. Yes, Nathan. Uh, was our Air Force fellow. Different question, and it kind of correlates with, with what you're talking about, but then also kind of as you look towards the China fight. Um, traditionally in the military, we will prepare for kind of the existential threat, right? And, and so your innovations and your strategies and doctrine will align against the thing that you think is, is most costly. But then often we find ourselves in a war which is mismatched with that strategy. So how do you kind of control for the effectiveness of innovation given the conflict and so like specifically something like an F-22 does not find itself particularly useful in Afghanistan so it may have been a good innovation but it does not really inherently lead to better effects and more successful. Yeah, you end up fighting the war that you didn't plan to fight right. but you get to go with the army that you have. Um, I think that is, that is a, pro a, a, a problem. <laughs> I think though for the cases that I selected though, um, in many ways, the, the, the North, North African desert fulfilled the dreams of a lot of the armed innovators of this featureless kind of sure. ocean that you have these land tanks, just like land battleships that are just floating around. And in the, um, in the U.S. Air Force case, I mean, the U.S. Air Force was, it, was claiming that they would be able to deter and then defeat the Soviet Union in the, in the, after World War II. Um, but they were also claiming that with that capability, they could then deter down the down the um, the threat levels, and you would assume then that fighting North North Korea would be relatively easier than fighting the Soviets. You might argue, um, at least because they're fighting in a conventional warfare at the time. So I think the cases that I've selected try to push back against that. But that that idea definitely does make sense. That you could you could end up your innovation might be wrongly tailored for the wrong conflict. That then is a civil military integration problem of whether or not we were s properly preparing for the fights that we were going to fight. Do any of the other military fellows, just, and then I'll, I'll jump to general questions again, have any um, examples that affirm or go against the theory you heard here today? Well, I mean, we're kind of stuck in a... So I came from the A-5, the Air Force A-5, where we were trying to build the Air Force that we need, right? And we, we have the Air Force that we have, and the Air Force we need is, is more tailored to a China fight. But now, as we watch, you know, Ukraine, we watch uh, Israel, um, 
are we going to be, how do you make the trade-off of, at, at some juncture, there, there, there aren't more, there's not more money to just dump on top. And so you, you have to do something, you have to divest of something, you have to make trade space. So how would you go about doing that in, in this period of time where you still have requirements all around the world, but knowing that we feel like there's a different, the fundamentally different type of warfare on the front. Yeah, I mean, in the cases here, at least, what we typically see is that the new capability is not overly tailored, right? The new capability promises to do a lot, not just in one single theater, not just against one percent mission set, but actually is a panacea. Um, the problem of, actually, we do need a tailor, and we need a tailor to specific threats, is actually a good thing, I think. In terms of it pushes back against wishful thinking that we can actually do it all with just one console operation, with just one platform, you can do everything. And so I feel like, I, I, I can't solve this problem for you, but um, I feel like the, the intuition that we can do it actually is a good one. And if it's a widespread one, in other words, this dilemma, that's actually a positive in some sense, as opposed to the other direction of saying, actually, we can do it all. Um, whether or not the ACE concept even will work in the, in the Pacific, I don't even know if that will work or not. Um, but that is the dilemma that we actually have to tailor to some extent. And that cuts against wishful thinking that we can't have it all. We can have our cake and eat it too. Yeah, we're not. Hi. Um, so, Kendrick, I have a question for you. Um, and I don't know if, if maybe in answering this, it might uh, actually address one of the points that, that Paulina raised earlier about um, uh, uh, necessity and sufficiency. But, so, so I, and I know what you're focused on explaining is harmful innovation, right? But, but you also have that two by two with commitments and resources, and and you 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 also are looking at beneficial and harmful innovation, right? so broader universe of cases. Um, and so I guess my, my question is, could you could you say a little more about what it takes for beneficial innovation to happen? Is it just the absence? Of those three mechanisms, is it in the absence of radicalism, the absence of wishful thinking, the absence of rush development that beneficial innovation takes place? Or are there other sort of positive conditions that have to be present to, to get beneficial innovation? And, and answering that question might maybe indirectly help tease out some of the question, you know, the answers to some of the questions that you've been asked about the mechanisms that cause harmful innovation. I kind of see the wicked mismatch and the absence of a wicked mismatch. So the presence of the wicked mismatch is almost like a constraining mechanism that really forces the military to make hard choices. Um, the absence of a wicked mismatch doesn't necessarily have a positive kind of like, I'm going to push the innovation towards a good direction. This absence really just removes this, it's almost like a permissive condition that allows military organizations have a higher likelihood of innovating well, but doesn't guarantee it. Um, and I think there has you have to identify other kind of causal factors that would then push the innovation process in a good direction, whereas the absence of it is kind of just like, you can. Um, and in the cases that I do look at, they're really there to like, in many ways, control for alternative explanations in terms of pairwise comparisons. I didn't really show up like a table of where they control. Um, and also demonstrate that there is an alternative pathway in which innovating the same technologies or incremental innovations did have a higher likelihood of success, um, that avoiding wishful thinking was important. That kind of thing. Chicago. Okay. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Sort of uh, related to what was just uh, being said. Um, can you again sort of tell us what could the British have done differently that would have ended up in that success? So, what was the, the key component of either the decision or the organizational, um, you know? Uh, that could have made a change. And it sort of ties up to, um, we often thought that organizations are sort of slow to change, and that inertia is basically a bad thing when it needs to adapt to a new environment. But it seems to me that if there was this uh, stickiness to traditional way of war fighting, maybe it would have been better. So it, it is the news that uh, maybe what we thought was a, a downside of things are really uh, could, could be some component of uh, not not checking out with uh, some of the uh, more traditional way of fighting like infantry. Um, second question is, uh, I think there could be 
different kinds of need or like a demand for innovation. One could be like the resources could be either it's societal or political that, that the government is not giving enough. It could be that you find, maybe not in the case of the US or British so much, but you find that there is a big, big enemy out there uh, threatening and you really don't have much resources, so you need to do something, right? So it could be political or it could be something that is real. And, and on, but in a different way, there, it could be that the new technology is out there. We all know that it's out there and somebody's going to be successfully make use of it, right? And whoever gets to make best use of it is going to prevail and then the tradition, which is a different kind of a set of um, circumstances where military might want to innovate. Uh, I'm, I'm, the question is, depending on the, the kind of need, demand that pushes for innovation, do you think that would make a change in how the militaries go about it and, and also about the effectiveness of the outcome? But, 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 you know, I ask that because some of the things that I hear a lot between the U.S.-China competition seems to me that the, how to engage in these uh, technologies uh, that are there but not really uh, integrated into the mode Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that I'll, I'll kind of jump around. Um, I think in terms of your, your kind of framing of it as a stickiness of traditional war fighting, having a positive upside. I think um, that's true. I think it's sometimes hard to tell if something is professional judgment, that's like we're gonna stick with it, or is it you know, bias and prejudice that we're just going to be parochial and keep to what we know. And so distinguish it between if it's, you know, if it's a good or bad thing to stick with the traditional way of war um, is unclear, but I think it's true that we that have natural predilection to um, criticize um, kind of any stickiness in an organization to stay with the old way of doing things. That kind of plays to the pro-innovation bias. Um, what could have the British Army done differently? It could have, it could have um, well, in terms of the Royal Tank Corps, could have uh, forestalled codifying its lessons, waited until the 19, thir early 1930s, while they're still actually doing some experimentation. Um, and, at the, at, and by the early 1930s, you actually have more tanks available, newer tanks, more. And so as you, as you kind of wait for that 1920s decade to pass, you could have better data. You could have uh, more data uh, before codifying lessons. Um, whether or not the British Army had, or the Royal Tank Corps had the will to resist moving forward so quickly, um, it's hard to tell. Um, I think in terms of questions like um, the different types or needs and demands for innovation, that kind of feeds into the security commitments itself. Like what do those security commitments look like? Is it a growing threat? What are they doing? Are they innovating? Um, and does that, from our perception, from the services perception, does that innovation make them a more dangerous threat or not? And does that increase the mission burden that we have to face when we go to war or if we go to war? And so I would see those kind of need demand questions of innovation kind of feeding into that security commitment kind of part of the gap. Eric, you had a quick follow-up? I do, right? So in response to Chicago's question to like what the British could have done better, right, your answer was they could have waited and pushed off kind of rush development, right? But earlier on, you said, well, they, they couldn't have. There were, there were too many kind of conflicting demands and the British had to move down this pathway. So I guess then the question is, is it possible to get out, out of this very wicked, you know, set of wicked spiral that's caused by this wicked mismatch? Um, you know, what does this mean about time horizons that your decision makers are, are thinking about, right? It seems like in your initial story that they're looking at this like short-term time horizon, but for a solution, you need to look at this longer time horizon. And this gets back to like, Roger's point about kind of, what are the actual scope conditions, right? Like, are these periods of small wars actually peacetime situations in the story that you're telling? Um, I think, yes. I don't think that so, is a different, I don't think it's like a deterministic theory. So these pressures make it really hard. But there is an avenue you could go down. You, you gotta take different types of risks. Sure. But it's, you have agency, and so like the policy implications are, yes, yeah, services can do differently, but they still face these huge burdens in a lot of these interrelated crises. And so the question of like, are we looking at short-term time horizons or long-term time horizons? Well, in a lot of these cases, like, it's both. They have, they're forced by wicked mismatch to really think about how am I gonna have near-term combat readiness to face 
maybe smaller wars or small threats, whether it be, you know, early Cold War instability crises and, oh, oh there's a war scare is going on. Or, and how we're we gonna prepare for the long-term fight against the Warsaw Pact. Like, we have to do both simultaneously because of these pressures. And so it's almost like, it's part of the, the pressure cooker. But can militaries ever make that choice? Um, that aspect. We can chat about it over yeah. here. Uh, no, I, you know, I'm we, we got time for one last question, which goes to Jim Walsh. I enjoyed your talk. I'm haunted by the fear that this question doesn't make any sense, or it's just wrong. But it's sort of set up by the other questions. And is it right to say that this is part of some story that, uh, not exactly what you're saying, but it could be part of a story that says when countries are up against it and, and uh, forced to consider you know, innovation in the face of difficult circumstances, uh, there's a temptation to do it poorly, but in the absence of difficult circumstances, there's no uh, push to do it. So you're not going to get it when you're not desperate, and when you aren't desperate, you're going to get it wrong. Yeah. I think there is a, I think there actually is a dilemma. There is like a, an enduring problem where military organizations that are conservative that don't want to change require lots of different types of pressures to make that happen. One, a key pressure being resource scarcity. Um, but at the same time, you know, in good healthy innovation takes lots of resources. And so you do have this structural problem, I think. Yeah, I don't think that's necessarily wrong. We got one time for one two finger <laughs> addition. <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. I think that, Just a super quick suggestion. I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe part of the answer to Jim's question is with those limited resources, resource the process, right? I mean, you yourself, quality of the process, right? So rather than the answer, you know, always being sort of the goal, the process itself. So we can adapt when we get it wrong, if we're going to get it wrong. Or when we find ourselves in a war we didn't mean to be in. All right, well, we find ourselves at the end of this engagement, so let's thank our speaker.